Hello, welcome to Literary Life. Um, so this is the second video of Chapter Chats for The Whisper Man. And at this point, we are beginning the book on Chapter 33, if you're reading along. So essentially, we have that creepy guy, Norman Collins, who is currently at the police station. And our, one of our main detectives, D.I. Amanda Beck, I have to write everyone's names down. Um, has been interviewing him and Norman Collins is still being very slimy and sleazy and he's very confident in the fact that you know he likes his knowledge of knowing about these murders that have occurred because that's his hobby but he feels like he's um not going he there's he's not doing anything wrong there's no reason for him to be nervous essentially and they're talking at this point in time about the recent boy who's disappeared um neil spencer and norman collins had nothing to do with it and he knows that so he's he's not concerned about this conversation he's having with detective amanda beck but what is interesting and amanda's kind of got like a what is that called card up her sleeve um they have found on a murder weapon that was used to kill the man dominic barnett so dominic barnett just a quick reminder was the man who had previously resided in the home that Tom just purchased, that Tom and Jake, our main main characters, had moved into. Um, when it was being rented by the elderly woman we met briefly, Dominic Barnett had rented it, and he was a bit of a sleazeball, and he was eventually found killed, I think it was hit with a hammer in the woods, um, and that murder was never solved. Well, they've recovered fingerprints on that hammer and have connected them to Norman Collins. So Amanda basically asks him, again, Norman's sitting there being kind of cocky and sleazy and focusing on Neil Spencer's murder. Um, but Amanda then asks him, where were you on the night of, and cites the date of Dominic's murder, which is several years ago. And Norman Collins goes pale and acts like he doesn't know and basically just shuts down and starts to say no comment and they put him under arrest and you are just like yes <laughs> because while this guy certainly well he committed murder here and um but you it just the whole time you're like oh this guy's so slimy and detective pete willis had felt the same way when he had talked to him previously and then this round as well um, so yeah, that was definitely a win. So meanwhile, jumping over to our main characters, Tom and Jake, um, their home is being, because uh, uh, the bones were recovered there. So it's now a, a crime scene and the police are there. So his dad, Detective Pete Willis, um, takes him to a safe house, which is essentially an apartment, not a great one, but an apartment um, over a garage or something like that. And um, that's where they're going to stay. Okay, so one of the things I am really liking about this book, this writing of this book is the characters are brought to life. Their, their struggles are developed and come through with the story. And I'm really enjoying that part of it. So essentially, we see Detective Pete Willis. He's left. He dropped his son, Tom, and Jake off at the safe house apartment. And he heads back to his place in that struggle um, with guilt and shame, um, with a low sense of worth and value, and um, his alcoholism is coming out. And before we saw that he would look at a picture of his ex-wife, who we now know is Tom's mother, um, and to kind of hold on to, to stop him from having that drink. And what's really cool this time is now that he's met his son, as an adult and he's met his grandson um he has hope he actually has hope and he sees that his son has turned into a um, really good man and has uh, managed to raise a child he's struggling but doing a great job as a single dad in uh, detective pete willis's opinion and um so now we have a slight shift in what is keeping him away from going down for him what is a bad path um, so that, that is really cool. Now we've shifted into part four of the book and here we, um, find out Tom drops Jake off at school and he starts talking again to Karen, who we've met a couple of times now. She is a mom of one of the other kids and she invites him to go for coffee. She knows this cool little coffee shop and he agrees. 
and he goes and essentially they're sitting there having coffee and he just ends up unloading. He tells her everything that's been going on. Um, so about the body found in the garage, they believe it is, it could be the body of uh, Tony Smith, um, who's bot who was a victim of the Whisper Man, Frank Carter, um, but his uh, bones were never recovered. So he's telling her all about that and how they believe that this body um, could be because of the age of the bones. So they're investigating that right now. He tells her about the involvement of this creepy man, Norman Collins, who it turns out was the man that had come by his house. And I think he had told Karen about that, like when it happened, um, but that he now knows that this man um, has some loose connection with Frank Carter and just with crimes against children or crimes and serial killers in general. And he tells her about the fact that they've been moved to a safe house, about the attempt at kidnapping on Jake in the middle of the night. Um, so it's, everything's going on. So they get up and leave. And it sounds like, you know, he's got a really great friendship developing um, with this, uh, per, with Karen. Um, so once they leave, the next chapter starts and uh, a waitress is speaking to another customer, a man who's been watching this conversation unfold between Tom and Karen. And you pretty much have the feeling that this man is the current um, Whisper Man murderer. And he has just been sitting there um, and taking in everything and watching Tom. So it's really a creepy kind of moment there in the book. Um, so meanwhile, <laughs> Still trying to get past that. It gave me like the heebie-jeebies. Because like how many of us truly pay attention when you're out and about, right? Yeah. So anyway, um, hi Grayson. So, <laughs> uh, uh, so Detective Pete Willis, you can tell like I'm completely like, oh my God, oh my God. Because you you think you're in this great moment. Like he's just unleashing, he's developing this friendship. And then all of a sudden you find out like the big threat is right there. And it's, it's really unsettling. Um, so Detective Pete Willis, meanwhile, has gone to the morgue, I guess it would be called, where they're, in, they're looking at the bones to, to basically see if they can identify who they are of this child that's been recovered from Tom's garage. And um, he gets a call from Detective Amanda Beck, essentially telling him that after a night in jail, Mr. Norman Collins, um, has decided to talk to them with his attorney. So I'm gonna go read and find out what Norman has to say. I, I don't know how you can go into a chapter knowing it's gonna be ick and yet still have your stomach churn like mine just did. Um, Norman Collins basically talks about how uh, you know, he's, he's got this serious interest in, um, these artifacts from crime. And so somebody reached out to him and he went to prison. Um, he went to visit the prison to talk to a uh, Victor Tyler who had a connection with Frank Carter, who's in prison. Frank Carter won't communicate directly. He works through other people in the prison. So essentially what Victor Tyler um, talks to Norman Collins about is the fact that they can offer him an experience. And he's got to be vetted, which is what Victor Tyler's role is. And he's vetted and he's approved for the experience. So essentially, he is sent to the home of a man by the name of, I think it was Julian Simpson, um, which is the house that Tom and Jake now live in. And uh, Julian Simpson takes him down into the basement and there he is allowed to sit with uh, Tony Smith's remains. That's the experience. So you have a murdered body missing boy who is, was murdered by this well-known serial killer and the experience is you can sit with that victim the police have been are looking for this body they don't even know where it is and for norman collins it's a very like spiritual the way he's casting it experience and he takes it very seriously and he paid and went and did it a few times and then at some point the keeper role of 
Tony Count Smith's remains is transitioned to Dominic Barter, who is our murder victim, right? Um, that Norman Collins is currently incarcerated for having murdered. And um, he handles things a little bit differently. He basically lets anybody in. And so when Norman Collins comes back for his special one-on-one -on -one time with Tony Smith's remains, he's led down to the basement, but there are other creepy, according to him, I'm quoting Norman Collins, looks down on these other men that are in there and doing things with Tony Smith's remains that he alludes to, but essentially says he doesn't see. He's so disgusted, he turns around and leaves and he demands a refund and Dominic won't give it to him. Hence the reason for the murder. That's how he justifies um, having murdered Dominic uh, so not just because of the finances, but also because he felt like so morally opposed to the way Dominic was handled. Like these were sacred. This was a sacred experience to be with Tony Smith's decaying dead body. And, um, he was allowing, Dominic was allowing these men to do gross things. And I'm, I'm trying not even to think about it. And, um, yeah, and that is the reason for the murder. <sighs> okay, <laughs> so Tom and Jake go back, they leave the safe house apartment and they're swinging back by their house to grab a couple of things before he takes Jake to school. And when they get there, there are reporters outside, a whole group of them. And they manage to avoid them and get in the house. But Karen, Tom's new friend that he just unloaded to, is one of them. So he basically realizes, A, he's disclosed everything to a reporter, and he doesn't know if she's really who she presented herself as at this point. So yeah, that happened. So meanwhile, this coming up is what I thoroughly am enjoying about The Whisper Man, and it is the dynamic between Frank Carter and Detective Pete Willis. And I don't know why I'm flinging my pen around like it's a wand or something, but um, I'm like afraid I'm gonna like, it's gonna slip and throw it at the monitor because like I am that clumsy. But the, the dialogue between the two of them is so intriguing and Frank Carter is such a well-developed villain character. I, he's so smart and there's so much going on in what he's saying to Detective Pete Willis. And what's really interesting is both Detective Willis and Amanda, Detective Amanda Beck, are aware that he's communicating in like riddles, so to speak, and they're they're starting to work together to try to figure it out. So essentially, Frank Carter goes one more time now to visit, or not Frank Carter, he's in jail, he's going nowhere, thankfully, but Detective Pete Willis goes one more time to visit Frank Carter in jail because at this point now they know about Tony Smith's remains and what they've been used for and that um, men have been coming to the prison to visit Victor Tyler who is acting as Frank Carter's right hand man, right, to access these remains and have their special time. So they need to go talk to Frank Carter about this and try to get more information. So Detective Pete Willis forces himself to go. He really hates these visits. And while he's there, it's interesting because Frank Carter keeps saying to Pete how he just doesn't listen. He just doesn't listen. And he's he basically, uh, Frank, or Pete, I'm confused, I keep confusing the names. Pete keeps, he shows them, they have pictures from the cameras camera cameras in the prison of all the men who had come to visit that Victor Tyler accomplice and so he's got the photos and he's showing them to Frank and Frank's like yeah I don't know him don't know him don't know him and then he shows them one of a younger man and Frank Carter kind of pauses and he's like this is the reason you're here this is the one you're interested in you're so obvious you know kind of thing and um Essentially, he he tells them that <laughs> this 
how easy it is to make a new identity. So why did they hone in on this man? They honed in on this man because when they ran ID checks, background checks on all of the men who had come to visit, this man's ID did not exist. It was a deceased person. They went out to this farmhouse where the parents lived and they were shocked because their son had died decades ago. Um, so they know that this man is smart and he basically created a fake identity and was coming into the prison to visit Victor Tyler um, to talk to him. So he had much more, I don't know, intelligent about that than the other visitors. So they've honed in on this young man. And what else is interesting is that they had thought in the very beginning when Pete first visited Frank Carter, back back to my pen, but I need to hold it. Um, he told them that he being Frank Carter told Pete that it always ends where it begins. And Pete thought that was referring to Neil Spencer's body because it was found where he was kidnapped from. That's eventually where his body was dumped. And Frank Carter tells him, no, that's not what I'm saying. So that's one piece to remember. So Pete Willis leaves the prison and he goes back to um, his partner in, in this moment, Amanda Beck, and essentially he's replaying the conversation with her because they are working together to try to figure out what is Frank Carter conveying. And one of the things they talk about is that Frank Carter had previously disclosed a dream he had when he had said that he he had um, pulled, it was, he didn't know if it was Tony in the dream because he would always pull the boys' shirts over their heads while he was torturing them. Now, there supposedly was no sexual element to these crimes, but it was incredibly, incredibly sadistic. Um, so what was important and what is going through Pete's mind is why would he cover their faces? Was it because he didn't want them to see him? Was it because he didn't want to see the boys? And then he thought about, he's like, all these memories are flitting through his mind as he's talking to Amanda. Then he thinks about the point where um, after he arrested Frank Carter in like a recent visit, um, Frank had asked for him. He would disclose something if Frank or if Pete brought um, Frank's wife and his son, but he referred to his son as the cunt. And, you know, of course, Amanda and Pete Willis weren't going to do this. This happened in the last video, um, so a little bit further back in the book. But that memory goes through his head. And essentially, this chapter just ended with a light bulb going off in Pete Willis's head. And what if the reason for him covering the boys' faces as he's torturing them is because he wants it to be his his own son. So incredibly unsettling, and I can't even imagine what it would be like to be a child in the home of a sadistic father like this that literally wants to torture and kill you. Um, so now we go back to how does this tie into it ends where it begins. Okay, let's find out. Okay, so at this point, Detective Pete Willis is working with Amanda to figure out where Frank Carter's little boy, now a grown man, by the name of Francis is. So they're trying to locate Francis Carter because they're wondering if he's involved. So that's going on. Meanwhile, Karen, the reporter, pseudo friend, um, comes by the house and actually it turns out she's um, quite cool because she, she discloses, she apologizes for not telling him. She did not expect, she you know met him at school um, and just liked him, but didn't expect for him to disclose and essentially put information on her like he had and then she was kind of in the situation where she's like oh my god I have the mother load and she withholds it she doesn't use it as a reporter um, and so that's essentially what builds trust with um, with Tom because 
she, she talks about the fact that she's like, oh man, this really sucks. She knows all this information, but that she doesn't want to do that to him. She genuinely is a decent person and yeah, that's her job, but um, it, it's she was just not going to report on anything that he disclosed. So then she invites him out for a drink. And uh, so they make plans to go for a drink and Tom doesn't have a babysitter and he decides to reach out to his father, um, which totally makes Pete stay. He gets his, Amanda notices, he gets a text and this huge smile on his face and Pete agrees to come babysit his grandson, Jake, which is really cool. Um, so meanwhile, Jake is, um, Jake's informed that, uh, he doesn't know that uh, Pete is his, uh, grandfather uh, but he's in, he's met him several times because of the police involvement investigation and he likes him and I haven't really gone into detail but Jake's a very quirky and intelligent and creative boy and his conversational style is hilarious um, and he's very matter-of-fact and he's very observant and him and he's talked to Pete a couple of times now and it's been a very fun sort of mature conversation for a little boy and um, he likes Pete and Pete's been very good with Jake and so Pete or Jake's not disturbed by the fact that Pete Willis the detective is coming to sit with him for a couple of hours while his dad goes out for a drink um, because of Pete but there is something going on so we hear that the little girl the whether she's an imaginary friend or a ghost I haven't quite figured out in my own head yet but I kind of like that mystery is mysterious I couldn't say that word um, component to it but she doesn't want Tom to go and she keeps she basically is saying I'm scared don't let Tom leave don't let him leave and it's interesting because yeah you don't know if it, it definitely is creating a sense of foreboding um, about Tom's going out but at the same time I'm, I'm sitting here kind of like but you got the detective watching you right Pete Willis like you should be good right right okay I don't know we'll find out let's read okay <laughs> I'm, tr I'm trying to process what just happened so Pete is babysitting Jake and Amanda goes with another detective they have located an address for Francis Carter, the son of Frank Carter. And they go to that home and it's like one of those homes that have an apartment on the lower level that you kind of dingy step down into and it's gross and dark. And they're knocking, no one's there. And they go in and the place is disgusting and nobody's like been living in there. It doesn't seem like for a while. And they get back, she finds one of the bedrooms that has been painted. Um, and it looks like it had been the room primarily used. Um, but what's creepy about it is that the painting is the same painting that was done in Frank Carter's um, extension where the boys were kept and their bodies eventually recovered. And so there, it's like a creepy um, child's drawing with flowers and a son with an angry face. So not the epitome of good times or good mental health, right? And so now we know, okay, Francis Carter, it, it's, it's Frank's son um, that this is going on with. So meanwhile, we have um, Pete who has put Jake to bed and he's sitting downstairs and he's just kind of chewing on everything going on with the case in his head. And he's remembering Francis Carter. He actually met him briefly because he went to the house. Um, and he is thinking about the impact, realizing that Frank Carter's describing um, wanting to harm his son, why he would cover up his victim's faces and how he referred to his son. And he's thinking like, what is the impact this would have on a child? Like you would feel so worthless. And he also recognizes that Francis must have witnessed what Frank did to these other children. And what would the impact of that be as well? And then it kind of occurs to him that you would grow up with a situation where you maybe wanted to make amends and make things right. So then he starts thinking back to Neil Spencer, who was the boy in the beginning of this book that went missing and whose body was later recovered. 
And one of the things that they noted with Neil Spencer's body is that it had been for the period of time, I feel like it was a couple of months, that he was missing. It, he appeared to have been cared for. Um, his body was in good shape. So the theory was that essentially something went wrong. Like whoever kidnapped him kept him for a long time. This wasn't a kidnap to immediately d rape and or just kill this child. The child was kept for a while and then something went wrong and that the death was not like a pre-planned death, but it was more of like a death, a circumstantial death triggered by anger or fear or something, right? Um, so now he's, he's starting to connect. Could this have been Francis's taking Neil to, to, create the experience um giving a child the love that he didn't himself francis didn't get from frank um and because of his issues um and having probably been traumatized and obviously having been exposed to extreme violence when something went wrong his reaction was not adaptive or healthy right it he ended up murdering the boy. So the minute that, for, uh, not Frank, the minute that Pete is kind of thinking these things, he hears Jake upstairs scream. So Jake has been dreaming. He's basically reliving the point when um, his mother died. He, his mother had, um, I think it was an aneurysm, but uh, uh, Tom and Jake had come home. They had been I don't remember. I think Tom had gone to pick Jake up from school, but they came home. Tom was doing something in the car. So Jake had gone into the house first and saw his mother lying dead on the floor. Um, so in his dream, he's reliving that and he wakes up from that screaming and Pete comes upstairs and uh, he, um, you know, kind of calms him down and Jake's like, I want my daddy. I want my daddy. And he's like, okay, I'll, I'll call your dad. Cause um, Tom's out on the date with Karen. So meanwhile, all of this is happening. Tom's on the date with Karen <laughs> and it's going pretty well, but Tom is experiencing a lot of anxiety about not being home with Jake and just like this feeling in his gut, like something's going wrong. Something's going to happen. I need to go home. And he's struggling with that. As I'm reading it, I'm thinking, God, like you, you're not dating. He's just new on the dating scene, everything they've been through. Like I could so see you feeling that way and trying to rationalize it right and talk yourself because you know the healthier thing is you have to be willing to separate from your child and go out on a date or go out for fun on your own um and you just have to you can't always respond to your anxieties so he's sitting there like talking to karen about it and having a conversation in his head keeping himself like i'm gonna stay i'm gonna do this kind of thing and his phone starts ringing so back to the house, Pete's calling Tom, right? Cause Jake's had a nightmare and he wants his dad. So he's calling him to tell him and he hears a door open and closed downstairs. So he hangs up the phone and he basically says, oh, there's your dad right now. He goes downstairs, Jake's still upstairs and he hears like a school scrappling thump. And then he hears slow footsteps coming upstairs. And then he hears a whisper. The whisper says his name. He hears somebody whisper his name. Meanwhile, back on the date, Tom has answered his phone and nobody's there. And he starts booking it back to the house. He just knows something's wrong. And the whole time, Karen's telling him, I'm sure everything's fine. I'm sure everything is fine. Because how many times in life is it, right? We panic. You can't reach a loved one, what have you. You assume the worst and you know it, it, they're fine. This is just one of those times. And he's running back to the house and Karen's with him. And he's calling and he's calling and he's trying to call um, Pete's cell phone back. And Pete's not answering. And they hit the house and Pete is laying on the ground. Severe, good head wound. Um, which is really upsetting because I really liked him and I'm, I'm like anxious now. Like, is he going to be okay? Um, and he gets upstairs and Jake's gone. Wow. Okay. 
Okay, so Pete's hospitalized, right? He's bad head injury, bad, bad head injury. And Amanda's gone to the hospital to sit with him. And you're just getting, she, she wants him to be okay. I mean, she has so much respect. The relationship, the friendship as colleagues they've developed in the time they've been working together is solid. And um, meanwhile, Jake is with Francis and we're getting a feel for how twisted Francis's sense of just not having developmentally appropriate expectations of how a child Jake's age should be treating him. It just, it, it's insanity. It's insanity. So like he brings a moldy food, but he expects him to eat it. Um, and Jake is very intuitive and he's very smart as well and very mature. So he knows that he needs to keep us calm and please Francis right now and hope his dad can find him essentially. And he, he keeps just like, Francis keeps putting Jake in these horrible situations. Like he wants him to draw a photo and then it's not good enough. And, and it's like, he's just, it's like he is actually trying to say, cross me, just push me and what, you know, and then what, so he's really, it feels like he's looking for an excuse to kill him. So kind of rethinking what maybe went on with even Neil Spencer and recognizing that it genuinely may have started out loosely as like a wanting to remedy things, but it, he's as sadistic um, as his father is. Uh, so we're getting a little bit of that. Um, so meanwhile, Tom is like losing his mind, as you can imagine. Your son's been kidnapped. You know, he's been kidnapped by the sadist. Um, and you're, you're just, you want to do something. And they have him go and stay with um, Karen. He can't stay at his house. He can't be alone. He is sick. Uh, he, and he is just struggling. And he's, he's trying his best to cope. And he decides that he's going to uh, look through. He wants to feel close to his son. He wants his son. So he's got his son's special bag. And we mentioned that earlier in the book where Jake had this bag of all of his favorite things. He kept with him everywhere. And I don't think I mentioned this, but when Jake, when Tom ran in the house and Jake was gone, his special bag was laying there on the floor. So Tom's got it and he's, he just decides he's going to look in it. And he says in his mind, like, Jake, forgive me because he does feel like he's violating his son's like privacy, but he wants to see, he needs to feel close to his son so badly. And a lot of what is in there is related to, um, Rebecca, who is, uh, Jake's mom, Tom's, um, deceased wife. And it pulls a lot everything together essentially so there's the poem about the whisper man that is in rebecca's handwriting so at some point rebecca had taught jake this like childhood rhyme that she had learned from her childhood so think about that for a minute that's significant right because that's an indicator that she was in an area where frank carter's crimes were happening enough that the children in that area would have created a rhyme. So that means Rebecca was in this area. There's a picture of Rebecca as a little girl outside the home that um, Tom and Jake had bought. Now, I, I think I touched on it when we were in the beginning of the book, but when they moved into this home, like they had looked at numerous places online and Jake was immediately drawn to this home despite the fact that it's something about the home was like ick, like foreboding structurally. It was just off, right? And awkward. Well, now we know why, because it is the home Jake saw in Rebecca's childhood photograph. She's out front in front of it. And he's like that he, in his own mind, Jake said was the, like, that's mommy's home. And that's why he wanted to, to end up there. So they have essentially moved into a place that um, Rebecca had grown up and she had at the time she was growing up was when Frank Carter was murdering his victims so the kids had created this chant about the whisper man and she ended up teaching it to her son and Tom's mind is just blown and he's really surprised that he didn't even know this you know like about her I mean she was his wife and they did have a relationship they did talk um, but this was a part of uh, her childhood he just you know, it's, it's funny, like he, he, 
he just didn't um, have a lot of detail around. Uh, so there is that. Um, but then the other crazy thing that he finds in this bag is a picture um, of the butterflies that were in the garage. So these butterflies, um, when the body was found, they were some kind of moth. I forget the name of them, but they're very unusual and they're very visually striking, but they're, um, they're common around death. And um, essentially he realizes that he can tell from the drawing that um, he has, this drawing is not Jake's. He has seen Jake since they've moved into this house. Jake's artwork has included this butterfly in it now, but that somebody gave this picture to Jake um, since they've moved to this house and Jake's been drawing this unique butterfly since. But where did this butterfly come from? Because these are the butterflies that were in the garage. And he realizes the only place Jake's really been that somebody could have given him this butterfly was Jake's school. So he tells Karen and they go to the school. And meanwhile, he's calling Amanda, telling her about the situation. And she's, Amanda is, you know, at the hospital with Pete. And she's just, she's trying to talk him out of going to the school. She's going to go to the school. Um, but he's, he's at this point, he's just flipping out. So he gets to the school and he's acting essentially like a wild man. And he wants to know, he has the photo, like who, if they know who drew this, where it came from. And he's really pushing like they're, you can, they don't want to cooperate and they don't even know right away that Jake's been kidnapped. Cause it like had just happened. I think the night before at this point, but the, is he says what happened they're like okay but we don't know we, we can't tell you that somebody here is involved with that like you can tell that the people around him really think he's lost his mind and one of the people there at the school one of the staff made the comment that it could have been George the photo the sketch could have come from George Sanders who's like a teaching assistant in Jake's classroom um, but George isn't there that day he's called in sick and um, he wants them to tell him where George lives and they're like, we can't, we're not going to tell you that. Uh, we can't give away that personal information. And he is like on the edge of just completely losing it. And um, so he does leave. They force him to leave. And at this point, Karen has kind of stepped aside. And remember, she's a reporter. And when he comes out and he's like insane man, uh, she's been able to track down George Sanders address and she gives it to him. Uh, so at this point, now we have, um, it's driving me, it's my nervous energy as I'm reliving this right now. Uh, so now we have, he's heading to George Sanders house. So meanwhile, George is upstairs, um, with Jake and he hears, he, he was downstairs and heard Jake talking to somebody. So we remember that Jake talks to that little girl. And I forgot about one of the details. The childhood photo of Rebecca, she, that's her. Like the child that Jake's seeing, the girl with the hair and the side ponytail and um, the one he's drawn in some of his photos, that's, that's Rebecca. So now we know at this point that this is, well, it could be a ghost. I, I guess we don't still know. It could be a ghost or it could be an imaginary friend. So if you're reading along, I would love to hear like how, what you're thinking about it. Um, so what is it like a coping mechanism, an imaginary friend in a way of staying close to his mom? Or is she kind of there in spirit helping out? It's, it's one of those things I don't know that it's, it's clear in my mind. Um, I was thinking of it like a coping mechanism, but now as I'm talking about it, I'm like, well, I don't know. I don't know that we know for sure. But it's his, the girl, little girl is his mom. So Francis is downstairs, here's Jake whispering, and he comes upstairs and he's like, who are you talking to? And we now know by this point that this, Jake is very much protective of this relationship and of this ghost that nobody can see. It's gotten him in a lot of trouble. So he, of course, defaults to nobody, nobody, and Francis is getting pissed. Don't lie to me, don't lie to me, right? And you're thinking, oh my God, it's about to go down when there's knocking at the door. So Tom has arrived um, at George Sanders' home. So essentially, 
Francis comes down. So he has Jake, like, upstairs, like, in a door with a lock on it. And he comes down and answers the door. And he's a good actor. And he pretends he's sick. And the whole dialogue and the situation, I mean, Francis is handling it really well. He's a smooth, smooth operator. And he's kind of doing that, like, you know, dude, you're crazy toward Tom, where you can see how easy it would be um, to question yourself. And you have all the evidence starting to point to this guy. Um, and yet you're like, yeah, he doesn't seem guilty, right? So they have some back and forth dialogue. Um, Tom is getting basically like, okay, I'm sorry. He apologizes for interrupting him and he's starting to second guess himself. Francis is closing the door and you hear Jake. Tom loses it and he busts in and Francis has a knife and uh, stabs him. But thankfully, Karen had called Amanda, the detective, and Amanda's there. And she busts in and uh, is able to essentially apprehend Francis. She takes him down. Um, and you think at this point, now we have Tom on the floor wounded. He needs to go to the hospital. We have the bad guy Francis down. He, know, he needs to go to the hospital. We have Jake rescued. And you think, okay, that's it. Like, my stomach's done flip-flops. I'm good. There's not much else. And then we get hit with one more chapter. And we're moving, and this is part now six of the book. Um, so it's, well, it's a couple more than one chapter. It's a couple short chapters in part six. So Peter passes. He doesn't survive the head injury. And I, I'm, I'm just so bummed. I'm bummed for a number of reasons. I feel like, A, I just liked his character a lot. Um, and you were just so hopeful, you know, that all he had been through and all Tom had been through and the loss and for Jake to have had this relationship of the potential and what was there and what could have, could have been. And it's, it's just gone. Um, so, so there was, there's that. And then you move into a chapter where you're with Francis in jail. So now you've got a situation where Francis is in the same prison as his own father, Frank Carter. And Frank's a bit of a powerful man in prison, right? And we got a twisted relationship there, right? Because of we know Frank, I mean, he called his son a cunt. And he did this, I mean, that's how he's seen him and has wanted to kill him. So France is in his cot and uh, the guard something's off and he looks over and he sees his dad standing in his cell doorway and he's terrified and he's talking in his head saying, I'm an adult now, I'm all grown up, you can't hurt me, you know, kind of thing. And as Frank comes into the room, um, Francis takes his shirt and pulls it up over his head and you pretty much no, Frank's just gonna beat the crap out of him, kill him. And on one hand, you're like, yay, because Francis wasn't necessarily a good guy either. But on the other hand, how messed up is this? I, I, I mean, it's just so, so messed up. And I feel like, like the psychology profession would have a field day um, on analyzing this uh, father-son relationship. So, um, yet the book does end on a somewhat, somewhat good note. Um, Amanda toasts Pete's memory. She has a lot of respect for the man that they've worked on this case together. And, uh, Tom and Jake's, uh, father-son relationship has really become close. Um, and we see a lot of guys <laughs> coming over. We, we just, we do see a lot of, um, you know, that having evolved from all of this and they're going to be okay. And that's, and that's what, and that's essentially how the book ends. Um, so Amanda is, is upset over her loss, but she's got a lot of respect 
um, for, for Pete and the man he was and holds his memory in high esteem. And uh, we have the father and son who are, who are going to be okay. Wow. And, and that's, that's it, guys. That's the Whisper Man. Um, I think I'm going to be sitting with this whole thing between Frank and Francis for the rest of the day. But I would love to hear. Let me know what you all think, whether or not you, you were reading along or you were listening to this. Um, I, I just, I can't imagine, I just, I can't imagine, I can't imagine what that little boy must have gone through growing up, what he must have experienced actually physically, what Frank did to him, what he watched his father do potentially to other little boys, what he heard. Um, I, I just, I just, I just want to go curl up with my dogs, Grayson and Zoe and a blanket and not feel <laughs> exposed to to that dynamic. I don't know. I need like I need purging. I need cleaning. I need good good love and juju and security and warmth and <laughs> lots of love. Lots of love. Thank God. Dogs are great for that. And actually my family are on their way home. They'll be in tonight. So my husband and daughter. So <laughs> Gonna be giving them all big uncles in there and be like, "What is up with you?" I'll just have to try to explain. I'll say, "Watch chapter chats. Watch the video. You have to hear what happened." All right, guys. Well, as always, thank you for watching. Thank you for taking another journey with me. And um, let's go read so we can do another.